Hey, this is John. I hope you're doing well. And uh, before I get into this talk, I just want to mention I'm trying to address what I feel is like probably one of the most important events in the church age, and I can't do it in sound bites. So I don't apologize for the length of these videos. If you need to split it up, just do that. Uh, but this is for Christians, church leaders, especially influencers, pastors, and then, of course, a very unique category of individual that actually acknowledges that the Mandela effect is real and that the Bible is being changed. However, this particular group of people have somehow come to the decision that we shouldn't talk about it, that we shouldn't try to warn anybody, and that we'll cause more damage than we'll do good if we try to. Here's the main arguments that I hear from this type of person. So we're told if we do this warning thing, we're going to cause people to leave the church. We're discrediting the Bible. We're sowing doubt and unbelief in the body of Christ. We're glorifying the devil. Uh, we should grow the church, not divide it with minor issues that we don't have control over. <clears throat> um, we should let people come to their own realization in their own time. God's will for the 90-year-old lady sitting in the church that she should just, you know, be peaceful and stress-free. Uh, Satan wants us to focus on negative things and on him. Uh, if you say this is not a salvation issue, why this frantic frenzy to push a mission for conversion of the churches? And... Uh, tread lightly when talking about pastors if you're not ordained and one yourself. Uh, wouldn't you be falling into Satan's trap by insisting churches focus on Bible changes? A trap thinking you're doing some great noble deed and that you are special for being able to see Bible changes that not everyone can. Well, now that one is very clearly a CIA talking point from 1967 bulletin. They said... Uh, Tell people that they're insecure and that they gravitate towards these things because it makes them feel special. So this is a great example of how people are mind controlled, thinking they've come to these thoughts themselves when actually they're just regurgitating stuff that was written in some uh, basement office in Langley. Uh, what is that, 50 years ago or something? Anyway, don't micromanage how the church is handling all this. If they don't want to focus on it, that's their business. Don't rock the boat. And then, of course, instruction for us to be in a subjection to authority, which I thoroughly agree with. Uh, here's a post from Jane Engelo. No need to discredit the Holy Bible. The Holy Spirit is our tutor. When we are saved, he will tutor us and will not allow us to be misled. So uh, I had a few posts in response to this, which I'll share in a second. Uh, of course, there's absolute validity to that idea in first john we're told the anointing which you received from him abides in you and you have no need for anyone to teach you well if that's true then why did god appoint prophets pastors evangelists teachers and apostles right so you have to take everything in the full counsel of god and so hundred heart posted this, I've heard multiple professing believers make statements something to this effect. The Lord will not deceive me or allow me to be deceived. I mean, of course, God's on your side, but it's just not that simple. It's, it's almost like he says the individual's claiming God to be a puppet master, controlling every aspect of our lives. The Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom don't operate like that. He's not a God of coercion. He doesn't force us to do things. If we choose to be deceived by choosing sin, lies, and the enemy's kingdom, he may try to woo us back, but he still gives us the respect and free will to choose. So that's a really great point. Uh, this is something that's going to come up over and over, so I really want to address this in some detail, because it does seem as though Christians, especially in the truther community, are somehow... I don't know. It's just a sense that I have that people are abandoning the idea that they're supposed to live according to the Bible. And, you know, so we're in this heresy hurricane, I call it. And it, it has a lot to do with the postmodernistic thought that's been th so thoroughly unleashed on us by the central planners. Postmodernism is just the idea that 
You know, your experience is your truth and my experience is my truth. So there's no absolutes. And, and even disagreeing with people is now viewed as violence and they'll be violent with you if you disagree with them. Uh, but at the very least, this mindset translates to most Christians or a lot of Christians having a kind of a don't tell me what to do attitude. Or in the case of our detractors, the ones that say we shouldn't talk about this, they give us the advice not to meddle in other people's affairs. So this is really the antithesis of obeying God and the teaching of Scripture. Just because the Scripture is decimated by the Mandela effect doesn't mean that you have any less obligation to obey it to the letter. And so we read in Matthew 5, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. So this does mean that what the law and the prophets taught and what was given to them, the original autographs, will remain in effect until the church has ended, whether the Bible changes or not. And of course, all has not been fulfilled yet. And so Romans 3 tells us that we're all accountable to God. The law applies to those to whom it was given, and its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. We have to give an account to this God. He's a holy God. He is our creator, and he has this funny idea that he has this right to judge us for the life that he's given us. It's a take-it-or-leave-it story, you know, God doesn't apologize for the way he runs his universe. But it just seems, and this is just me, I don't know, that a lot of Christians seem just incapable of being discipled the way that you see them in the early church. Um, but this kind of culture rot and this fear-mongering of politically correct speech, which is really permeating the church as well, it's really been masterfully inculcated into society, uh, but it's nothing compared to the perceived permission that I see marginal Christians uh, that have seized upon the fact that their Bibles are changing. I see Christian Mandela believers regularly throwing off the decrees of God when it doesn't suit them. And they just claim, well, that, that's a change. You know, that doesn't apply to me or, you know, I don't have to obey that because it's a change. Well, changes are very often very minor. The meaning is still there. And then in many cases, my memory of the scriptures is very different from theirs. In other words, I don't think what they are saying is a change is actually a change in many cases. But I personally don't believe anyone can really be dogmatic about that issue. So I just silently disagree and then, you know, but to me, it just seems clear that uh, Christians are just using the Mandela effect as an excuse so they don't have to be accountable or be in submission to God. That's what the Bible does, man. It's just Ten Commandments. Boom! It's just like absolutes. It's the opposite of postmodernism. So I say that to highlight the fact that I really do enjoy the luxury of not having to figure out what I believe about most things because my Bible tells me what's right and wrong. So my response to this question about should we warn people is not my opinion, but it's what the Bible teaches on the subject, you know, either directly or through principle. And so in this situation, it doesn't even seem complicated, right? You, you tell me I shouldn't warn people and my Bible tells me that I should. And so it's, you know, could be the end of it right there. But just to reiterate, though, this video is really for people that acknowledge the Bible's changing, but they feel like we shouldn't talk about it. Now, they know the Bible has sexually charged innuendo, biblical paradoxes, all manner of confusion, but somehow they feel that it's too perilous and damaging to try to warn people about it. I mean, there's some validity to it, I guess. It's like if you were just to warn people about don't sin, yeah, that's, you know, 
not going to rock their world. But if you try to tell them that the Bible's changing, that the, the devil who's a defeated foe, he, and, you know, he appears to be having the power to do something which, in their mind, directly contradicts what the Bible teaches. It's sort of like, well, if God wrote the Bible and he promised it would never change and it's changing, there must be something wrong with God. That's kind of the, the narrative. But, you know, they're like, I can't trust the Bible. I can't trust God. Yes, you can trust God. That's what I believe God is trying to get us to do for real for the first time which I'll talk about more as we go on, so stay with me. Because what a lot of folks don't realize, if they're just, you know, haven't really thought through, is that God gave the devil power and authority to change the scriptures in Revelation chapter 13. And, and there's other passages as well. And then, of course, these, this event was foretold, really clearly, in, in Daniel 7.25, I mean, I know people freak out when you mention Enoch. I mean, he was a patriarch. The guy was one of two people that was caught up to heaven before he died. So he's like a stud. He's quoted in the book of Jude verbatim. So his writings are at least prophetic. They're, they got the endorsement of Jude. So Enoch chapter 80, verse 2, he describes the Mandela effect to the T. In that day, all things on the earth will alter and will be out of their time. Right? Revelation 22 is a big one for us. So if God told us that this is, was going to happen, he isn't contradicting himself. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 tells us that the Antichrist will be able to pull off stuff so incredible that it will seem like he has all power. You know, things like the Mandela effect. In that passage, it's called a lying sign and wonder. A sign and a wonder makes you wonder. It's like, what? Well, if the, if the Mandela effect is not a lying sign and wonder, I don't know what is. It is a brain bender. I mean, our timeline is different. We're in a different timeline or a different parallel universe or something. It's like a hundred movies you've seen. <laughs> it's crazy town, all right? So, this debate really comes down to two questions. Does God want his bride to be warned about this, or should we just leave everyone to themselves and hope they figure it out? And then the other question is, which option is going to have the best result? Warning people or not warning people? In other words, let's say just to keep it simple, the body of Christ is just 100 people. So you warn people, everybody, and maybe in this case, 100 people out of that 10 backslide, but 90 don't. And the 90 avoid accepting the false picture that's emerging in the scriptures, right? Biblical paradoxes, graphic, pornographic innuendo, utterly confusing, nonsensical content that is, you know, scattered through the Bible now. And because they're warned, they're able to sidestep all of that instead of feeding on it and getting slow boiled into a distorted picture of who God is. And by warning, you also help most of them to avoid taking the mark if it turns out to be that close to be implemented. It's, it happens in our life, which I believe it will. So by warning about the changes, they're less likely to be deceived by the Antichrist, who in our opinion will use the altered Bible to get Christians to deny Christ and accept him and his mark because the things that will define him and his ways are now appearing in the scriptures. So when Christians are forced to choose between taking the mark or being shut out of everything where you can't work, you can't buy food, you can't use the hospitals, They'll be easily pushed over that line for in many cases. Because they're going to have confirmation in their Bibles that the guy that's going to save them from starvation is the Messiah. Because everything he's saying about himself is going to be in their Bibles. And they'll be convinced just up is down, right is wrong, evil is good. Because it'll be in their word and the pastor will be endorsing the word. The list of things in there now will curl your hair. I mean, it's... 
If I just went through the list for a new person, you'd think I was just a mocking, mocking God. And But you could look it up. It's in there. So don't get mad at me with your holy indignation. You know, I'm just reporting on what's obviously happening. Anyway, just like I don't know if those stats that I just rattled off would, you know, be correct. You don't know either, dear soul, how many people would backslide if we warned the entire body of Christ. You don't know if it will be the opposite in 90 will backslide or anything. And actually, our experience is the opposite. Our community almost universally reports that this event has been the greatest thing to ever happen to your walk, our walks with God. So in this uh, interview here, I did with uh, Antonine Graves. Uh, he has close to 10,000 subscribers. And I asked him, you know, because he shared the Bible is changing supernaturally with his fellowship. And he said he had no pushback. He didn't lose, you know, anybody that he could tell. And he's adding subscribers. So, you know, that's a pretty big sampling, 10,000 subscribers. And uh, so, you know, influencers like himself, church leaders, pastors are coming out. They're, it's undeniable. And they're telling their congregation. And it's not blowing up the church. Now, if you have a de denomination where you have overseers or you have a district, you know, you may have a tough time. I'll just be honest with you. You, you may have to get your anchor families on board, you know, before you roll it out to the congregation. Once you do, once the district finds out that you're telling the Bible's changing, you might, you might be looking to rent a building. But you can bring your congregation with you. You could start a new, a new church. And what I can guarantee you, okay, is if I knew there was a pastor down the road talking flatter, talking Mandela effect, talking... All this stuff, 9-11, NASA's fake, deep state, 13 families, I would be there, and most of this community would be there. So you want to double your church in 60, 90 days? Start talking like a conspiracy theorist from the front of the room. It's relevant. So this whole idea, though, of not telling people, it's just, right. it's so, I don't know what to call it. It's... It's illogical. How about that? I mean, if you had a family that was in a burning building like this, they're asleep, would you decide not to warn them because you didn't want to upset them as they're forced to run for their lives? <laughs> would you rather hope they smell the smoke and wake up in time? Do you truly believe it would be better to risk people burning alive than to risk having them have to process some difficult emotions. I mean, it seems ridiculous. If they all died in the fire, would you want to do it over differently the next time? <clears throat> what about evangelism? Would you apply the same logic to preaching the gospel? You know, would you say, don't try to warn the sinners about the fires of hell, it might upset them? Well, if you look at the Bible characters, how they acted, you get a very different picture. So, Paul, in 2 Corinthians, says, knowing the terror of the Lord, what do we do? We persuade men. And, and when you look at Paul's ministry, he seemed to be very busy persuading people all the time. I mean, his days seemed to be filled with persuading. He was a persuader extraordinaire. How about you? You seem to be the opposite. You seem to be trying to persuade people not to persuade. You're an anti-persuader. How does that make you feel to be working against God? I mean, do you, do you understand what you're actually proposing by telling us to be silent? Do you believe that God wants people to be deceived? You agree that this is happening, but you don't want us to say anything. I mean, if you had a choice to have your faith challenged and have your beliefs turned upside down for some time or be deceived, which would you choose? I mean, we have proven over the last six, seven years that church leaders are just gatekeepers to keep out this topic out of the public discourse. They will block this truth at every turn. So this mass deception is going to continue unless someone answers the call 
and, and is willing to speak up. Because I think, too, that folks forget that we're co-laborers uh, with God. God gets the job done through his people by the Holy Spirit. He confirms his word with signs following. So following what? The preaching of the word. Proclamation comes first. God does do things solo without man, of course, but I think it was D.L. Moody, I think, said, it's almost as if God does nothing lest men pray. And we have that in Amos um, chapter 3, I believe, where God says, surely God does nothing unless his, he reveals his secrets to his servants. So what was the Great Commission? Go heal, go preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. And so it's quite evident if you look back, let's say a thousand years, that if men didn't go, then many things would have never happened. Then this is just God's way. Proverbs 24, 11, deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. This does not give me the sense of, oh, well, let them figure it out for themselves. It's none of my business. Is there any indication from Scripture throughout the Bible that we should not warn people because it might cause them discomfort, bad emotions, or even to backslide? Well, the answer is a resounding no. It is God's consistent habit to warn his creatures. The entire Bible is filled with warnings from Genesis to Revelation. God warning people directly, like in Genesis 31, verse 24. God came to Laban in a dream of that night and said to him, be careful that you do not speak to Jacob, either good or bad. Now, it's also the habit of all the patriarchs, the disciples and Jesus himself to spend a considerable amount of time and energy warning everyone that would listen. And it does appear that in many cases, the people being warned were not happy about being warned. They were uninterested and even hostile about it. But that didn't stop the Bible characters from doing it. And we're supposed to emulate the Bible characters. So in, in Matthew 18, this actually provides detailed instructions on how to deal with people that were consistently resisting being warned. The teaching was that you needed to be consistent and keep warning and then even escalate your efforts to warn if they didn't receive your warning. Because God is merciful. He doesn't want people to be separated from him. So even though he knows that people won't accept his warning, he warns them anyway. And then he sends people to warn them. And of course, we have Jeremiah, or your Mandela-affected Bible calls him Jeremy. And God sent Jeremy uh, to warn, but God warned the warner that the warned will not receive his warning. You like that? Therefore, you shall speak all these words to them, but they'll not obey you. They're not going to listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer. So, what does that tell us? Just because it might not go well is no reason not to warn them. God wants them warm so they will be without excuse. And when you read the way the apostles conducted their ministries, it would seem that warning was what they did more than anything. Uh, here's a passage which is pretty interesting. Acts 20, verse 31. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to do what? Admonish each one of you with tears. <laughs> wow! Wow! Paul was a warning dude, man. <laughs> His testimony is that he was warning people with tears for three years nonstop. Sounds like he was almost obsessed with warning. People are like, oh my dear, here comes Paul again. He's going to warn us again. I mean, Paul might have even needed a 12-step program. <laughs> he was addicted to warning. Guy was out of control with his warning. <laughs> he started going to a WA meeting, Warner's Anonymous. <laughs> Hello, my name's Paul. I'm a Warnerholic. 
Hi, Paul. Well, why didn't Paul say, well, if God wants them to know, the Holy Spirit will tell them. Only those that God shows this to will know. It's not our place to force this on anyone. It's not our responsibility to push our beliefs on everybody. Who are you to tell them? You just think you're special. No, I, I'm biblical. All right, Thessalonians 5.14, we urge you, brethren, ad admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. So this seems to really give you the idea that we shouldn't um, hold back, right? It's the opposite of the idea that we shouldn't say anything. And then Colossians 1, we proclaim him, admonishing everyone and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete. So that we may present every man complete. I mean, these guys have taken ownership of the people that they had oversight of. It's a clear sense that they had a responsibility and a duty to both God and their fellow man. We are not to leave them to themselves and hope they figure it out. We are to be co-laborers with God. And the Bible clearly teaches that we should warn, even giving us specific directives that we should warn. So we're, a, we're essentially warned against not warning. Second Chronicles 19.10, whenever any dispute comes to you from your brethren who live in their cities, well, we have that with the Mandela effect, between blood and blood, between law and commandments, statutes and ordinances, listen to this, you shall warn them so that they may not be guilty before the Lord. So we have a duty to, our, to the body of Christ who are, are mysteriously blind to this. And what, what would happen if we don't? And wrath may not come on you and your brethren. Thus you shall do and not be guilty. So this passage introduces the idea that if we do not warn, that God will hold us accountable. So for all those that know the Bible is changing and know that most don't realize it and still suggest that we should be quiet about it, I would just say hush up. You suggest that God's angry with me for causing people to doubt the Bible or cause them to backslide or that I'm spreading confusion or dishonoring God and you're posting your warnings to me that I'm going to hell for talking about this? You're suggesting that I'm God's enemy when it's actually you? If you know this is happening and you want to keep it a secret, I would say if anyone's going to hell, it's you for being a co-conspirator with God's enemy. Your threats that I should be silent are too late because God has already threatened me not to be silent in 2 Corinthians 19.10. So this has just triggered knee-jerk reactions. You don't know your Bible and you haven't thought through what you're saying. Uh, we also have the same threat from God in Ezekiel 3.17 and Ezekiel 33, 7. We all familiar with this, but in the middle it says, but his blood I will require at your hand. That is for not warning. So those suggesting that we should be quiet have raised the idea that we should trust the church leaders or be in submission to them. And they're suggesting that we or I am arrogant and thinking I'm I know better than pastors to whom God has chosen. But again, the Bible is filled with examples of men of God that spoke truth to power. So your suggestion is unbiblical. I'm sorry. It's not about me. These church leaders have abdicated their mantles as shepherds through their silence, their breathtaking blindness, their willful ignorance, and in some cases, their decision not to disclose this even though they know it's true. Definitely God wants us to warn. Here are just a few more examples of Bible characters and their consistent practice of warning others. And so let the full counsel of God just sweep over your soul and eradicate any remaining doubt that you might have. I'm not going to quote every chapter and verse with all these references. It's on the screen if you want to look it up. 
Okay? Genesis 41, 28. Joseph warns about famine. The angel warns about imminent judgment. Matthew 24. Jesus warning about last day's conditions. Matthew 24. Warning to flee to the mountains when a prophecy is fulfilled. Luke 21. Paul's nephew warned him of an ambush. Deuteronomy 8, warning against backsliding, warning against idolatry, warning not to be deceived, warning to guard your heart, warning to be honest, warning to listen, warning against idolatry, warning against sinning, warning against disobedience, warning to be saved, warnings against selfishness, warnings to avoid hell, warnings not to distort the gospel, warning not to deny Christ, warnings to watch out for leaven of the Pharisees. Philippians, Philippians 3, beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Okay, and then Colossians 2.8 is really interesting. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Now, Elementary principles of the world could be construed to mean like when church leaders sarcastically say that the, this is ridiculous. This is impossible. I hear that all the time. These are supposedly men of God and women of God who believe the Bible, which is filled with supernatural uh, things. But they're they saying that this is impossible and they're just goofy about it like can you explain how philip was translated down the road i mean what's the physics of that miracle hmm? can you explain the physics of exactly what happened the moment philip started to dematerialize or however that thing happened no well if you're dumbfounded by the suspension of the laws of physics in that case, and any 20 others I could mention in the Bible, then you need to, you know, get off your high horse, supposed intellectual superiority talking down to us and being so sensible and rational, like we're so unlearned and crazy, just because you find this event hard to grasp. So is Philip being translated? Um, impossible and ridiculous? No. And then this passage in Colossians also warns us saying, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men. Traditions of men like the Bible can't change. That's right. The Bible can't change tradition or dogma is based on a daisy chain of unrelated passages that are true in and of themselves, but they don't prove the Bible can't change. I've listened to many learned men and women of God teaching on providential preservation. And when you listen to the Bible scholars teach on this, they will tell you about the inspiration of Scripture. And they'll go on and on and on for a long time about the inspiration of Scripture. And then they'll go on and on and on about how God can't lie. But neither of those prove that the Bible teaches that it can't change. It's an assumption that because it's God-breathed, it can't change. That's only an assumption. It's a dogma. Inspired scripture can change if God allows it, which he has. And the fact that it's changing doesn't make God a liar. Because... The passages that you're focusing on as proof texts don't clearly teach that it can't change. It says, thy word is forever settled in heaven, not here on earth. And providential preservation isn't even a teaching of the Bible. It's an observation of history that God has ordered events to preserve the Bible. But there are many examples in scripture where God chose to withdraw himself from his people when they were disobedient. So maybe he was preserving scriptures as it's been observed throughout history, but now he's withdrawn his preservation, just like the Bible said it would in many of the prophetic passages that we have found. I'm sorry, this is happening, and it's happening right under your nose, sir. 
So Titus 1 verse 10 warns that we must be careful of false teachings. Well, now, we unfortunately, we have a Bible, although it still contains much of what God has given to the original authors, it is now littered with pages with false teaching on it. Jihad Jesus, bring those who don't follow me before me and slay them here. And Jesus has female breasts, mastos, in the original. Jesus is telling us there's two men in a bed, and then one's raptured, giving a clear indication that you can be gay and go to heaven. Two women grinding. Paul is robbing churches, and the original um, meaning of the word that's translated robbing means robbing. Peter is running around naked. Jesus is spitting in people's faces directly into their face to heal them now. I could go on like this for the next 15 minutes. That's false teaching that are now appearing in your Bible. Um, and you can't, you can't possibly, with a straight face, try to suggest that these are just bad translations. Not taken in the aggregate. I've seen atheists and God-haters and Christ-haters try to cherry-pick difficult passages. There's always been thorny, difficult passages that we had to wrestle with, and the great theologians of all time wrote the commentaries about it, and, you know, there's some things I know, there's some things I think I know, and then there's some things I don't know or understand. But this is different. <laughs> this is, first of all, completely unfamiliar to everybody. But then on top of that, not all, but many of the changes are now paradoxical to who we know God is and what we know his word said before. So it creates complete uh, opposites of what, what should be in the Bible. Anyway, Daniel 7.25 is a warning that the Antichrist would seek to change times and laws in the last days. Well, what do you think times and laws means? What are the times and laws that the Antichrist will seek to change? Hmm? What law is he going to change? Could it be God's law? Is the word laws translated in Daniel 7 translated as the law of God in Ezra 7? Is it fair to suggest that Daniel 7 is saying that the Antichrist will seek to change space-time itself and the Bible? Much of Revelation 22 has to do with the Bible being changed. Verse 18, if any man add unto these things or take away, God will add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now, what's interesting is I just saw this today because I believe this chapter 22 speaks in great detail about the Mandela effect. Um, and that it's an end times warning that the protection will be removed from the scriptures. Okay, and if that's true, then in verse 16, let's look at what it says. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. So the passage that I believe speaks very in detail about the Mandela effect is also giving us the charge to go talk about it, telling us that we should warn. So Christians earning, urging us not to warn people about the Mandela effect are like those that say, leave me alone, mind your business, how dare you say anything to upset me? Well, I'm following these examples that I've just shared, the patriarchs, the apostles, Jesus himself, who really didn't have much regard for people's feelings. I mean, let's be honest, Jesus went right into the middle of the power structure of his day and was quite disruptive. <clears throat> I mean, he was having a meal with the Pharisees and he just started calling them names like whitewashed tombs and vipers. I remember the first time I read that, I was shocked. 
So this censorship advice is totally unbiblical. It's very unkind. It's really the opposite of what you think it is. And let me just go on record saying that I'm really offended by people that are always offended. Like snowflakes offend me and thin-skinned crybabies that are lecturing us out of a misguided human sentiment offend me. Like Peter offended Jesus when he rebuked Jesus based on his man-centered temporal paradigms. No, you won't go to the cross, Lord. But he, Jesus turned and said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So your motivation to protect people is really backwards, and you're not going to accomplish the eternal purposes of God by keeping this a secret. This is a battle for the souls of men, and it will not be a nice, pretty battle with a bow on it. It will not be won by the squeamish. Now, squeamish is an interesting word. It's a person that's easily made to feel sick, faint, or disgusted, especially by unpleasant things. So if you're squeamish about rocking the boat and upsetting people, then I think you're going to have a problem because I think it seems to me that's exactly what God wants to do. This is a huge disruptive intervention by God through the agency of the devil, like the flood, like the Tower of Babel, and there were other minor incursions, the angels coming down in Genesis 6, He's trying to get the bride's attention. Most are too busy ignoring their self-directed lives and their cerebral approach to walking with God. Or worse, they're living in open rebellion, but they're silencing their screaming consciences with endless Bible studies and church attendance, thinking that somehow their PhD level of Bible knowledge somehow cancels out their empty, dark souls and their abandoned prayer closet. The Bible's become an idol to many, so don't try to make yourself smarter than God by trying to stop the surgeon's knife that is being deployed on his patient through this judgment. So in a lot of ways, we become like the disciples who were able to witness the transfiguration on the mountain, and instead of treasuring the experience and allowing it to transform them, they said, hey, let's build tabernacles. Let's capture this supernatural God and put him in a box that we can control. Let's make it permanent. We'll turn the Bible into a book of formulas and incantations. Let's control God by emphasizing the role of Scripture. That's right. I said it. A lot of theologians suggest that Satan contended for the body of Moses. It's a really obscure passage where it tells us that Satan contended with the archangel for the body of Moses. And they're like, well, but it doesn't tell us why. So people have, have surmised that, that Satan wanted his body because he could get man to worship the bones of Moses. He's probably right. And I've seen, like, this idea of the scripture being deified. I've seen young, on-fire believers that are out winning souls that are then counseled out of the scriptures to calm them down by older, more learned pastors. Calm down, they said. And I pulled them aside and said, don't calm down. Don't listen to him. Go back out there and stay uncalm. <laughs> Get it going, man. You worship the Bible. You've lost your way. I'm not saying just Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Please don't put words in my mouth, okay? This is what so many pastors have done to the Bible. They've, they've turned this book into a book that's worshipped. And I'm a Bible lover, so don't accuse me of attacking the Bible. It's not me that has to repent, it's you. The church has deified and institutionalized the Bible, so now God is taking the Bible away. No, it's not. Yes, he is. No, it's not. Yes, he is. That's my response to decrees when people tell me they haven't lifted a finger to research the Mandela effect. They don't know what the seven forms of proof are. They have no way to answer the seven questions. And yet they'll bark at us. 
this is not happening. And my response is, yes, it is. So, so then what are you going to say, right? Where, where do we go from here? But, you know, people are like a four-year-old. You can't swim without a floaty. But now you're like 23 years old and you're still swimming with a floaty. So God's taking the floaty away. And you're going to have to grab onto him. We all are for real or we're going to drown in this supernatural swirling hurricane of heresy that's been unleashed upon this wicked world. I mean, Pastor, you don't have a clue how many people in your congregation know the Bible's changing. And they're just tolerating you out of a lack of better options right now. But they're hanging by a thread. And they're watching you Sunday after Sunday, misquoting and stumbling over the scripture. In other words, I sat in a King James only church. This was my church. King James only pastor. I got a King James. He's got a King James. And he's preaching from, I think it's 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And I'm looking at the book, and it says charity now. And what's coming out of his mouth? Faith, hope, and love. Because that's what was in his King James Bible all of his life. But now it's changed. But what's coming out of his mouth is not what's on the page. But I couldn't say anything because my wife thinks I'm nuts. She's now divorced me because of this. And that's the terrible saga and pathos, nightmare scenarios that's going on in your congregants because you're ignoring this. But God is calling us to himself because scarcity breeds desperation. It's like the difference between your fleshly prayer out of obligation that you offer before you eat versus the prayer you offer when you're coming off a three-day water-only fast when your heart is genuinely bubbling over with gratitude. <laughs> Scarcity or lack of something breeds gratefulness or desperation. I mean, you haven't eaten for three days, you're not going to pray like this. Oh, sovereign God, I beseech thee in the name of all that's holy. Humble myself under thy mighty hand. I receive this morsel with eternal gratitude. Bless this food, dear Lord, in the hands that have prepared it. Amen and amen. I'm not sure if you're an amen or an amen person. You've got to get that right. Well, finding out the Bible is changing is not unpleasant. It's a doctrinal atom bomb. But it's actually a rescue mission. God's always got the victory, right? I'm like, God, what's the victory in this? Well, this is what I believe is the victory. Just as the way Jesus and the apostles turned cities upside down when they went into them, God is doing it again in this hour by allowing this to happen. It's very similar in reverse to what we witnessed when Jesus came on the scene interacting with the Pharisees. And it was only Nicodemus that was able to perceive that the religious construct that he was participating in, Nicodemus, was being penetrated suddenly by this guy. It's like this individual who was obviously infinitely superior, right? In, in his grasp of the priorities and how things should be operating and Nicodemus was able to perceive that Jesus' interpretation of the same passages that the Pharisees were reading seemed to be way more compelling when they were coming out of Jesus' mouth. Well, he was, the way he was twisting it, right? Interpreting it. And Jesus' choices and his actions were all filled with life and love. And Nicodemus could easily see that the Pharisees' demeanor was bitter and angry and fearful. And, and they were needlessly sniping at everything that Jesus said. He could see they really weren't interested in the truth, only in silencing the man from Galilee so that they could hold on to their power and their wealth and keep the status quo. And so they could avoid what Jesus was really trying to get at, which was their hearts. So... In a similar way, Christians are hiding from God in their Bibles. Think about it. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were substituting their knowledge about God for a relationship with God. Can't you see that? With them, I mean. 
When I read the Bible and the Pharisees, it's obvious they were hiding out in their knowledge. They were substituting their knowledge. They thought that was the way that you know God was through the knowledge, amassing knowledge. But they were hard in their hearts. And those that try to silence the truth of the Bible changes are the same. Because Nicodemus was drawn to Jesus because he saw Jesus was both rebuking the system while simultaneously inviting its participants to come out and join themselves to a more correct way at the same time. He was irresistible. Look at this. Acts 18.26 he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So there's a time for adjustment that is upon us. Jesus upended the order of the Pharisees, or he, he attempted to, and what I'm trying to say is he's doing it again. He's It's a course correction. And the Pharisees couldn't recognize God when he was standing in front of them. And in a similar way, the church leaders and Christians of today cannot recognize that same Jesus is leaving their Bibles and it's being replaced by a voice of the stranger. And the inability of church leaders and believers to perceive these changes in their Bibles is so stunning to us that many of us feel that inability to see it is a greater phenomenon than the changes themselves. It's like you're looking at the sky is blue and you're saying it's purple with green polka dots. And we're like, huh? Or we're seeing the green polka dots and you can't see them. That's what it's like. And so this is why we must warn because the, the, the state of affairs is so dire and the church leaders are probably never gonna humble themselves. They have no idea what's going on. They don't want to know. They're like Samson. Judges 16, verse 20. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke from his sleep and thought, I will go out as before and shake thyself, myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And right now, pastor, you don't know that the Bible has left you. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he went back and forth with the devil who was quoting scripture, but his reply was to quote the scripture more accurately. He used the term, it is also written. It was a, I see your $20 and I raise you $50. It meant which, you know, what you're saying is true, but there's something that is more true. And so God is saying that he's going to shake things up because most of my people are way out of the way from what I have attended, intended for them. So in John 3.10, we read these words. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. This passage is fulfilled in your hearing today. And I ask you, pastor, are you a teacher of the Bible and you cannot perceive that your Bible is filled with changes? I know that you've probably been noticing them and you know in your study, but you've just kind of sloughed it off as translation confusion, probably. But you are smack dab in the middle of an end time sign and wonder, sir. And you can't see it because you have a doctrine that the Bible can't change. And you've believed the programming that this is a narrative of unstable, unlearned kooks. Well, I'm not unstable or unlearned. And if you want me to share that with you, come on my channel and talk with me. My email is pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. Please send me a, your contact information so we can have a dialogue. And I'll get you on our live stream and we'll just have that dialogue in the city gates. So thousands will hear your arguments and you'll have a chance to save many from their delusion if you're right. If you're so confident in your position that you're comfortable calling us crazy, then you should have no problem leading us out of our deception. And so many bring up the idea, well, what about the new Christians? 
you know, the censorship crowd says we shouldn't warn them because they're so weak in faith that they'll backslide. Well, that's the very reason to do it. The opposite is true, because if the pastor is not going to alert them, then they are going to be the least likely to find out on their own and be able to endure until the end, even through what's coming, because it's going to get really wild weasel from here on in. So if you're new to the scriptures, you know, you're going to need to learn the voice of God quick and get you know, some discernment when you're reading your scriptures so you're not consuming these changes too, too readily. And then seek out people who know what's happening, you know, uh, and that have studied the Bible for many years prior to the changes and consult with them. It's, it's really by design, uh, an oral tradition is being reinstituted out of necessity. You know, Paul told those around him to follow me as I follow Christ. What do you think he meant when he said that? So this is very, this is very um, dire. You know, the pastors are going to be co-conspirators with the devil. Then we'll go around you and we'll speak directly to your congregants. And once a certain percentage of your congregation realizes that you're willfully ignorant, and you're withholding one of the most significant events in the entire church age from them, there will be a mass exodus from your church. And this is not a topic that you're going to be able to avoid much longer. I would suggest you reach out to me. Please wake up or else at gmail.com. Send me your name, your phone number, and the best time to call, and I'll, I'll contact you. If you're a pastor or a church leader or a Christian influencer, and I'll give you as much time as you need one-on-one -on -one to understand how this could be happening. And actually, once there's enough demand, the Lord is leading me to establish a weekly mastermind and support fellowship for pastors, church leaders, influencers that have integrity and don't care where the truth takes them. They're willing to lose everything like I have, and they want all that God has for them. And I'll be there each week to help answer questions. I will give suggestions. I'll shorten your learning curve on how you can pastor your flock under what I call a post-canonized Bible church era. Now remember, if that statement is blasphemy to you, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the people that concede that this is happening, but are urging us not to talk about it. So this is God's way for us to warn. And the idea that we're meddling in things we shouldn't be concerned about is just New Age fluff nonsense. It really is. It has nothing to do with the Bible or the kingdom of heaven. God has consistently raised up people to proclaim a word, like Martin Luther is a great example. Proclaimed salvation by faith alone. Now what if Martin Luther stayed silent and didn't say anything? And you can hurl all the baseless accusations at me you want, that I'm doing this out of some prideful ego thing, or I think I'm better than those that don't see, but it's not going to work. It falls on deaf ears. It really does. Your words fall to the ground, and most of the people in this community don't believe you either. So I would just repent or hit the unsubscribe button with all due respect, because, you know, we love God, we love his bride, and we have a pure burden to do what's right in the time that God has given us. You know, because I get hammered. I mean, people are telling me I'm going to hell. So, you know, you're the enemy of truth, not me. The video that I'm doing here is designed to silence you once and for all. So I never have to waste one more second responding to this type of concern. Because if the bride of Christ continues to refuse to really examine what I call the doctrine of the force field, this dogma of providential preservation, then they do risk being vulnerable to embracing the Antichrist when he comes on the scene very soon. And by that, you will lose your soul. I don't believe you're going to hell if you don't acknowledge the changes, but you are in a perilous scenario for sure. Because we've, we've already gone through the mask of the beast and we couldn't buy with, you know, without the face diaper and many people lost jobs, have been denied medical treatment all manner of intimidation when they didn't take the jab. 
And now we've had the rollout of the Fed coin, electronic currency, which will be combined with social credit score, a new pandemic, 15 minute cities, lockdowns, completely control and enslave us, setting the stage for the final rollout of the Mark of the Beast. Yeah, we're the, we're the lucky contestants, definitely, to preside over last day congregations. So you better start realizing you aren't in Kansas anymore. Much of the infrastructure that will be needed for what is described in the book of Revelation has appeared to most pastors as conspiracy kook nonsense. But now it's uncloaking before their eyes and they're being humbled. It's beginning to dawn on them that many of the conspiracy kook nut jobs were right. Most of this stuff is true. That includes flat earth, by the way. Moses was right, and Neil deGrasse Tyson is a liar. What you've done is you've concluded that Moses just wasn't enlightened because now we have pictures from space, but you don't realize the picture you're looking at of the big blue marble is 12 strips of data, and then they've added colors and clouds. NASA is fake. The Earth is flat, just like the Bible teaches. The breakaway civilization is real. The 13 families, all that good stuff, underground bases, chemtrails. That's just the top of the... That doesn't even go into the real stuff. That's what the people that will orchestrate the one world system look like. I mean, the book of Revelation is really wiggy stuff, right? You're not going to go from Andy Griffith living in Mayberry to genetically modified chimera scorpions flying around like it says in Revelation, five months, stinging men and they can't die, right? You're going to ease into that reality. That's where we are. We're easing into the book of Revelation, okay? We're trying to warn you, wake you up. And to you, the Mandela effect fits into this same category of conspiracy theory kook stuff. I have watched most pastors get triggered and become sarcastic, and arrogant and start talking down to me like this is kook stuff that's why because you're a, you're a mind control victim it's mk ultra mind control and you're bewitched beyond words that you can't see your own bible and that's why because you haven't begun to question yet you have to repent of not looking that's the centerpiece of the truther is you question you have to question the government, Fauci. Look at all the pastors that lined up behind Fauci. He's Joseph Mengele, for the love of heaven. I'm telling you, God's going to start removing people that don't line up with reality. In 2023 and beyond, I don't believe you can possibly properly minister to the needs of your people and avoid the snares that are coming unless you are a full-blown conspiracy coop nutjob operating on the fringe of society. A lot of pastors have a distorted view of Romans 13. If the government passed a law that says you have to sacrifice your firstborn child to the government, would you do it because of Romans 13? No, of course not. Okay, so I'm going to end with the 90-year-old lady story. This is one of the posts that I got. God's will for the 90-year-old lady sitting in the church in the pew next to you might be for her to be oblivious to the Bible changes. Just let her live out her life. Well, I got a different response from the 90-year-old lady for you. The 90-year-old lady, turns out, has been praying for revival and for the supernatural to begin to move in her church for 40 years. And so we come and we educate the pastor and then he rolls it out. And so she now finds out the supernatural is happening and she gets inspired and she goes and gets two of her friends and they go into a fasting and prayer mode in their room and they do what, uh, um, what's the guy in the Welsh revival? He said, I'm not coming out. It was two guys. We're not coming out unless you come down. We're going to die in here or you're going to move. And the, two, and the 90 year old lady and her two friends start praying like that. And God sends revival on the northeast seaboard. And hundreds of thousands of people get saved, including a bunch of people in the District of Columbia, where they run the deep state. And as a result, 
the FEMA camp that you were going to get dragged into doesn't get activated. And so as a result of us telling the people about the Bible changes, you don't go get thrown into a wood chipper in the FEMA camp. How do you like that? You like that? <laughs> All right, that's one hour and four minutes. Thank you for listening. I hope this was helpful, and I hope that I will hear from you if you're a pastor, church leader, or influencer. At please wake up or else at gmail.com. Send me an email. Let's talk. And if you'd like to come on the channel, we'll have a, a discussion. We can even have a full-on debate. I have somebody that will moderate. All right. God bless. Thanks for listening.